uh, that was what I was trying to reflect was that this is a very innocent place. And yet, even in an innocent place, bad things can wash up on your shore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or at the end of your driveway. Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks to where our guest today is Tess Gerritsen, and we're going to be talking about her latest thriller, The Spy Coast. We're conducting this interview before our book, report, re, book reporter review comes in, so I'm going to share praise from a couple other places. Kirkus gave it a starred review and said, expect mystery, action, and bloodshed, and this exciting thriller launched straight from the peaceful shores of Maine. And another starred review from Booklist, compelling reading throughout with astute characterizations. Readers of Richard Osman's Thursday Murder Club Mysteries will love this. It's a book reporter bets on selection, and I think this is Tess's best book to date. I am telling you folks, I love this. And that's saying something because I loved her Rizzoli and Isle series. So with that intro, welcome Tess. So great to have you here. Oh, it's so great to see you again, Carol. We go way back. So we go way back. <laughs> like I think the first Rizzoli and Isles book, like we're way back, you know, pre right. that. You know, I heard you talk about this book at the U.S. Book Show, and I love the interview that you did there. And I love where the idea of it came from. So let's start by you sharing that with our readers, because it's such a good story. Yeah, it, um, it's a quirky little thing about my my home state. I moved to Maine 33 years ago, and my husband, who's a doctor, ha opened up a medical practice. And part of bringing in new patients is you want to find out more about them. So he would do occupational histories and he would get this answer. I used to work for the government, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> and after a couple of times, my husband came home and he goes, what, what is with this town we've moved to? Who are these people? So a real estate agent told us they're all retired CIA. Um, and then I became much more, uh, you know, I guess observant and found out that two of my neighbors on my street were retired spies. I found out that the parents of my one of my son's friends were married spies. And a lot of them have just come to move to Maine. And so it, may, it gave me a, a, a little, I guess, more curiosity about who these people are that I run into at the post office. <laughs> it's a small town. Um, we have a lot of gray haired people here. And I, I just started thinking, what were their lives like before they retired? What did they do? Um, and that just seemed like a book. Oh, it just sounds great. But I could put you in the supermarket going, how's she touching the carrots? How is she touching this? What's in her cart? Why is it in her cart? You know, yes, it yes. just sounds like a completely different thing. Did you interview any of these people for just some general thoughts on the subject or are they really like closed mouth? I did not interview them, but I know who some of them are. Uh, and I also have, um, I know who some of them are sometimes through their children. Um, or their grandchildren who've told me, oh yeah, dad was a spy. You know, they, a lot of the families already know what, what dad did or what mom did. So um, I relied instead, I thought that the one way I could get people maybe to tell me the truth is to look at their memoirs. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of CIA memoirs. Um, and, you know, and, and you you get a, a sense more of, of what their lives are like overseas, what it what it is to be a spy every day. And for the most part, it's just a job. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is just really getting to getting into the, you know, beneath the people's brains and figuring out what it is they know. It's not running around with guns like James Bond. It's it's making friends and cultivating friendships and using the information that you find out. Yeah. My one friend, Chris Wickham, was on the hostage rescue team. And I said, what's it like? Because I'm thinking swooping in a lot. He goes, no, it's a lot of lying in wet fields with a gun trying to figure out what's going on. It's a lot less like, you know, let's go in and do this. It's a lot more waiting than you think. And it's a lot more, you don't know what you're going to do next. You know, Ben says this great line, if we can't trust each other, how can we trust? And Maggie retorts, that's a pretty thing to say, Ben, but you know better. We all do. We shouldn't trust each other. We can't afford to, not in our business, and I don't even trust myself. And I was thinking, what must it like to go through life like that, that you don't know who is going to be doing what to you? And that was such a great one. I pulled that out. Tell us about like you know what you're thinking about these people. That is precisely what I was trying to get out of, you know, with this story is it's not just about the gunplay or the or the spy story or the mystery. It's really about what kind of a personality 
goes into this work and what does it do to your life? Mm -hmm. Um, Imagine that every friendship you make, there's a sense of maybe there's a there's a a payback here. Maybe there's a um, a, a reason I'm this person is trying to be my friend rather than they like me. Uh, and also, it's the it's the question of do you trust your spouse? I mean, mm-hmm. how, what does that do to your marriage? Right. Um, how did you meet this person? Uh, how do you know that they really fell in love with you and not what you do? So it's that's I think it was the psyche of espionage that was most fascinating to me. And I wanted to explore that because that's what Maggie has to, has to figure out for herself. She has to decide whether she trusts this man she loves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, as she meets him, she's trying to figure out, wait, was he there for a reason? Like he walked into this market. Was he watching me in advance and set up to meet me? Was he following me before? And you lay in bed with this person and you're not sure, are they there to get me? Are they there to stop me from doing something? It's got to really be this psyche kind of crazy thing that you're living with every day. Yeah. And um, I think it's got to be very hard. It, first of all, I would be a terrible spy. <laughs> I can tell you right there. I would be an awful spy because I would just tell you the truth. Um, and also to have this relationship with the truth that is not necessarily real. I mean, what you say you may know you're lying. Um, how do you do that? How do you become a convincing liar? And yet this is something they have to do all the time. Yeah, all the time. They just walk in with that blank face and this is what's going to happen. I also love the name of the town is Purity. And I felt that was a real play on words. It's like, this is a town that everything is very pure was in my head. And then I'm like, it's anything but. So where did the name of the town come from? Well, I wanted to give it the sense of innocence because, you know, I think for a lot of people, except for the terrible events of last week that happened and, in, in, you know, uh, the shooting in Lewiston, most people in the country think of Maine as a as a pure and innocent place. And for the most part, I feel it is. Um, it's a it's like the biggest neighborhood. The whole state is one big neighborhood. We know each other. You'll run into the governor dumping her trash at, <laughs> at the local recycling center. Um, and that was what I was trying to reflect was that this is a very innocent place. And yet, even in an innocent place, bad things can wash up on your shore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or at the end of your driveway. Yeah. How much research did you have to be doing on what happens at a chicken farm? And I definitely want blue eggs. I definitely have I, one of the girls in my book group brought us eggs the other day and somebody got a blue and I was like, oh, I want the blue egg. <laughs> it's my favorite color. <laughs> well, I, you know, everybody says, how do you know about chickens? Well, I know about chickens because my son used to have 70 chickens. Oh, uh, <laughs> again, he was, he had this visions of being a poultry farmer. So I would help out. Um, I, I, when he went on vacation one January, I was there feeding and watering the chickens every morning in below 15 degree temperatures. <laughs> um, and yes, there are blue eggs from a certain type of, of, yeah. of chicken. So I, yeah, I, I really came to love chickens and, and just like roosters intensely. <laughs> <laughs> no roosters in the hen house, no roosters in the hen house. You know? I'm just thinking as I was reading this, I was like, wait, she has way too much knowledge. Like this is hands-on knowledge. So now I know where it came from. I've got it. And what about the the name, the Martini Club? It could have been the Scotch Club, the Bourbon Club. Why martinis? Because it just sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, I I used to belong to a book group that involved martinis, <laughs> and it, it turns out that I love martinis. And the martini that may that uh, that Maggie drinks that's that's actually my martini. Um, so that it just it just came out. It fell out. You know, I don't I don't plan these things, and it's a spur of the moment thing. It's a little bit like when Joe asks you, "What's the name of your book group?" and Maggie just pulls it out of thin air. That's how it came. It came out of thin air. Out of thin air. Well, I think that your recipe for your martini should be on your website. I think this has <laughs> got to be there so we all know, like, you know, what to do. And they also indulge in some aged spirits, which are hoarded and sipped. And I really like that. Like, who's going to drink the last inch? Who figured yes. out? And it's the long morn. Like, what, as an example. And I just love that because I could just picture them sitting, drinking, but they all have their own memories of what's going on. They all have their own past about what what gig they did that they really haven't told each other of what's going on. So just picture sitting in that room and reminiscing, but not talking. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. And the, and the whiskey aspect of it is another thing that I feel like I have deep knowledge of. <laughs> Because I have, husband. They, they, you have to come hang out here. You know, I have sipped that long morn, and it was a thirty year, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is like, I I can't believe I'm drinking something so delicious. Right. Uh, so yeah, when my spies drink a concoction, it's usually something that I've tried sometime in my life. But you're right, when you're of a certain age, and um, I'm of that certain age, 
um, you're looking back a lot. You're mm -hmm. thinking about the things you did that you're proud of, the things that you're not proud of, things that you will not tell your friends about. And that's what I imagine them sitting around a fire, maybe hinting at an operation that went wrong or the operation that went right, but never really indulging in, in truth telling because sometimes it's too painful. Yeah. They, you don't want to look back. You want to just be able to say, we retired. We're not doing this anymore. And I love that they've got this book club and yet they said they don't often read the book. Like sometimes it's like, this is the book. Reading. And they bring the, like, I'm bringing goat curry and I'm bringing this. So the meals that they're bringing are these elaborate. And it, I just feel like they're, they need this sense of community with people who understand who they are. So it's not about the book, though. It was interesting to see what they were reading. It's more like, we just have an excuse to then get together and hang out and talk. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. And then they bring, of course, their international background. So, you know, anybody who's lived overseas for a certain amount of time has picked up recipes that you're not going to get here. Um, yeah, and it, and it is true. I think I have I have a line there that says chili addiction is a real thing. Yes. And, and it is. Yes. <laughs> so once you've gotten addicted to chilies, it's like you've got to put chilies in everything. Yes. So here they are looking up a finding sources for, for Sichuan peppers. And um, that is it's that is what I can surely see from anybody who's lived abroad. And these people certainly have. Yeah. And you know, when you get the pension for something, we it's Halloween today as we're recording this. And we always have chili on Halloween, which was like something we started with the kids. Well, my husband goes, what's for dinner tonight? I said, it's chili with a lot of Chitopo chili in it. I said, that's the only way we make this right. And it's not the recipe, but it, you're right. If you've got the spice or something that becomes you because you've had it another place, that's got to be part of the menu. And I feel like they're all bringing things that they've tried. I mean, I love the opening scene where she's um, walking around and she gets the soup or it's, it's one of the opening scenes and she has the soup and she's eating the soup. And it's just a little thing, but you feel like you're eating it with her. And when Danny comes over and he's eating the soup as well, you feel like there's this instant connection of you being in that place. And I feel like you got us in each of the places where they went. That's what I felt like I was there. I felt like I was there with the cuisine or whatever. Well, that's great. I mean, I have been to all these places that I write about in, in the story. And I, do, I think it would be really hard to write about Bangkok and, and Istanbul if you haven't if you haven't been to those places and smelled the smells of the local mm -hmm. market. So, um, I, you know, I wanted to bring that that sense of 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 international sophistication to the to the pages. Yes. And that's exactly what each of these people have, because you've got to fit in at each of these places. You've got to know the customs, what you do and don't do. And the book takes us from Bangkok to Istanbul, to London, to Malta. And you can tell that you've been there. You can tell just by your writing about the streets and what people are seeing and even the way they're hiding and ducking down the corners. You've got to know that that city has that kind of streets. That's not going to happen in New York. New York is not this, like, you're going to be on an avenue for a very long time and then have to go try and hide. So you were picturing the places just by your descriptions of how they were hiding and how they were trying to get away in each of the situations. So. Yeah, well, uh, and it was it was fun uh, kind of going back in memory lane and remembering all these places. Yeah. <laughs> and now we've got this poor woman. She's the purity acting police chief, Joe. Uh, and she has to deal with the challenges of Maggie and her friends. So this woman has just been named the um, acting police chief. And she is trying her best to solve every single thing that comes her way. And then she gets thwarted by the quartet, as I call them. <laughs> So let's talk about her. <laughs> Joe, okay, Joe Thibodeau, which is a very main name, you know, for this French Canadian kind of name. Um, she is a multi generational Mainer. Uh, she's her grandparents are probably born in Maine. She is a a solid figure. And she reminds me of a lot of people I've met here who have been here for generations. They know their communities. They know their people. They know what's going on behind closed doors. They know who's a troublemaker. So she's the perfect cop for this little town. And she is determined to keep it safe. Mm -hmm. Now this dead body shows up on this uh, uh, on Maggie Bird's driveway and Joe's got to figure out what's going on. And it flummoxes her every step of the way that these these martini club people who are retirees from away seem to know a lot more than she does. Mm -hmm. They are quicker to crime scenes. They figure things out sooner. And she's thinking, who are these people? Mm -hmm. um, and that's it, it, the conflict, I think, is is not only between outsiders and and people who live here. It's also about generations. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe is in her 30s. These people are in their 60s and 70s. Um, and it's it almost feels as if the arrogance of youth 
blinds them to the abilities of older people. Mm -hmm. She thinks she's the cop. She should be doing this thing, these, uh, you know, figuring out this crime. And yet these older people are ahead of her. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I think it's that it's that slow sense of respect that she develops over this, the course of the book to realize that, yeah, they they're old, but they they really have it all over me. <laughs> They've completely figured the whole thing out, folks. You know? <laughs> and I love that when I go into her house and she says she has a security camera where most people would have like a ring light. And she's got this very elaborate security system. And they're like, is somebody going to get the chickens? Like, is that why you've got this? And it's. <laughs> It's so great because you're only in your frame of mind. Joe is just in her frame of mind as she's walking around. The other policemen are just in their frame of mind. And they're like, oh, the security, like what's going on? You know, the chickens are all cameras on everything, right? And the infrared, and who, are, who, is, who is this woman who lives here? Yeah, so- and, and they want to see everything on the camera. And she goes, well, I left at 6.30 so we can go forward from there. But she doesn't want them to see anything else they might be seeing. Like, let's get them to that point forward, which she hasn't seen as well. I really loved it. I really loved it. So then she falls for Danny, who's such a great character. And throughout the book, we don't know whether he's involved. Is he another agent? What is he? It's really just going back and forth. And you have this measured way of setting up the two of them together. Was that what you were like really thinking when you're writing going, let's, let's, let's have this little bit of doubt going back and forth between them. Well, if the doubt is there because I, I didn't know. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm writing this. I'm going, is Danny good? Is Danny bad? I'm not sure. I just know he's kind of a, you know, he's a wonderful man. He seems like yeah. he's a wonderful man. Um, so until the resolution of that question, I did not know. And I did not know what was going to happen to their marriage. And I think that the resolution was kind of a shock to me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was when I saw that, I was like, wow, that was not what I was expecting at all. Um, so what I'm thinking is, We've got these characters, they've all been to these assorted places, typically on different missions, but they have these skill sets that when brought together, make them very powerful. Like they walk into a room and it's like, it's like, I have a, I would, I have a, a, a set of skills that not many other people have. And I think when you were working on their backgrounds, were you thinking about future books? Because this is going to be the Martini Club series, I take it going forward. So were you thinking, I have to lay some groundwork now of who they are, because in the next book, they can't be something else. Or are there different people in the next book? Well, first of all, I didn't know it was going to be a series. Um, I just, it, to me, this was a one-off. This was like, mm -hmm. you know, but then I get to the end of the book and I thought, oh, I'm going to miss them. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to leave Purity Maine. I don't want to leave Joe Thibodeau behind. And so um, I was not thinking about continuing them for another book. I think they just kind of define themselves. Mm -hmm. Um I, I knew that I knew who Maggie was. I mean, and, but but these others, like the married couple, they were so much fun. There's a you know, he was not he was not in the field. He was just sat you know, he sat at a desk in the CIA, but his wife is the smart one. Mm -hmm. And that combination of he you know, he really respects her. He thinks she's the smart one in the family. And he tries to be the, the good house husband <laughs> to take care of things. I'm going to take care of things. Not a problem. Not a problem. Right. Right. And then the other, the other two gentlemen, um, one of, you know, because um, being a, in academics is a big cover for, um, for non-official agents abroad. Um, I had to have an academic in there. And I, I love that sense that he's a history professor. So he also knows a lot about the history of the places he's going to. And then finally, there's there's Ben, who's kind of the, I guess you would say almost the mobster type of guy who yeah. would be the heavy man uh, whenever you need something. So they they kind of define themselves. And, um, and I love the way that they interact. I mean, whenever there's a need for somebody to find something out on the internet they all look at ingrid because they know she's the one who knows how to use the computer the best <laughs> she's going to get in there quickly but they all have their roles they all know like you know i'm going to bring this and there's also a little bit of um uh, romantic tension within the group that maggie's adored for years and you know she's the main character here are there others that are going to be in the spotlight later on like are you going to or she's the main character for the next book main um she is she and joe are going to be continuing as the main characters um and uh, i'm not planning on bringing any any well new active spies into the next um episode but the next book is really much more focused on the town of purity and a crime that happens there um but again we have that wonderful interaction between young joe who's now 
finally going to become chief of police officially and um and our five our five martini club people <laughs> it's like and then she's going to sit there and say something's going on and she's just going to call them like let me just bring <laughs> you guys in let's just stop with the game you obviously know what you're doing don't tell me what's going on you know and you leave the door open for lots of characters in future books. Like you leave the door open of who can come in that comes and visits who was a former spy or family members coming home and what they knew and not. Do you Have you made notes about those ideas or is it like, oh, Carol, come on. You know, like, I, I, I don't yeah. know everything of where I'm going on this, you know. Well, the second book, I'm working on the second draft now. So I pretty much know how, how that one works. Um, the, if there is a third book, and I, I, I assume there will be a third book, I am going to be using a very, it's peculiar, another peculiar uh, thing about my town is that we have an annual conference here. I mean, we only have 5,000 people who live here. We have an annual conference that has to do with international affairs. And they bring in diplomats and leaders and uh, politicians from around the world to descend on this little town in the middle of winter to come and give a talk. Wow. Um, and it's open to the public. And I always wondered, how did they get these people? Because these are names that we see on the television all the time. They come to this little town in Maine to talk. Um, and uh, it, it just occurred to me that that's a great setting for something to go terribly wrong. Oh, perfect. Absolutely perfect. You can sit there and say, you can sit in the audience next time and go, hmm, what could happen here? What could we do here? You know, something's going to happen. You know, let me sit in this room. So do you outline in advance, which I'm not sure you do because you didn't know how it was going to end. Do you do any outlining in advance or just sit, sit down and write? I don't do any outlining. I've tried it. I wish I wish I could. Mm -hmm. um, but every time I try to write an outline, I'd always end up just tossing it away because things go off in their own direction. Um, I think that probably I'm more driven forward by <clears throat> the characters and what they're telling me, mm -hmm. what they what um, what seems to happen at, um, on the spur of the moment is very often when the twist happens. Mm -hmm. And those odd little twists occur just out of the blue. I mean, I don't plan them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a good way to write a book. It's it's uh, it's very frustrating because I end up writing myself into blind alleys and then I'm stuck. But as one person told me, it's when you're in that blind alley and you're stuck that the really brilliant idea comes. Yeah. So maybe, maybe it's a good thing that I do it this way. Yeah, it's like if you get her down the street and she's got to get out, and you don't know what to do. You've got to either be clever or fast. There's there's right. one or the other. It's going to be clever or fast and or both or both. Or you, you know? back up and think, how did I get here? Maybe I should have taken a left turn instead. And that and that draws your plot in a different direction. So it's a it's a fun way to write. It's a frustrating way to write. And I think that if I'm surprised, then readers are surprised as well. Yeah, definitely. And there are so many scenes that are, you know, and I don't want to give anything away, but she drops somebody off someplace and something happens and then something else happens. And it's all these things that you, she would never think that that was going to be happening in that situation. And if that person didn't go to that place, but everybody knew that he would, it never would have happened. But where you also are looking at when people are doing this, they're looking at a bigger picture. They're looking at the family. They're looking beyond just the person and saying, where can I, how can I wreak havoc on this? And they're getting to know enough to be able to move the needle, whichever way they've got to do it. And I find that it's, um, you've got to be incredibly smart to be sitting there and getting yourself out of some of these situations. And I like that you wrote older, smart characters, as opposed to Oh my gosh, they've got gray hair and they don't know how to do anything anymore. No, these people are yeah. super clever, super clever. <laughs> you know, there's such an advantage to being an old spy because you aren't noticed. Mm -hmm. um, that's the whole point is you don't want to be noticed. Uh, my my husband, has, who is, uh, he always likes to call himself the gray man because he says he will show up at a party and nobody will remember that they've met him the night before. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's and it's really true that we notice the we notice the the pretty the handsome people, we go to a party and, and those are the faces that we remember, but we don't maybe remember the bald guy in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he's the one who's like taking notes. <laughs> so um, I, I do think that um, we should be making more use of this experience, or maybe that's why so many spies, when they choose disguises, the disguise is always that they make themselves older. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, what can I do? Because you don't want to look young. You don't want to look young going into the place. 
And it's true though. It's the person, like when you're in the room with them, their heads are going the whole time. And I think that you do a great job of writing the inner monologue of what they're doing. So we're with them every single step of the way of what's going on. It's not like they get to the end of the room and we see, we see them plotting to get to the end of the room. And I think that's one of the things I really loved about the book because I felt like I was traveling with the characters, especially with Maggie as she was moving around and feeling all her emotions. You did such a good job of, you know, what would really happen in that situation? How would you feel? So, yeah. oh my gosh, this is like so good. Did you know how you're going to rap before you began or obviously not? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know a lot. Let's put it that. I mean, to begin with, I didn't know if her marriage was real or not. That, right. that was that was the primary question for me. That was a big emotional question for me is mm-hmm. I, I love this man, but do I trust him? And you know that that's actually a trope that's been used again and again in spy novels. Do I love this man and is he bad? Um, mm-hmm. And I chose to maybe do the twist in the other direction than most spy novels do. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's interesting too, because there's a, a scene at the beginning where he does something when they're out to dinner at this very expensive restaurant. And she knows exactly like she's like his match on going in and solving what happens to happen with this person that's on the floor. And I found that so interesting because it's just like, well, I just like, you know, saw it on TV or something like that. I just knew what to do. I watched somebody do it. And I just found that she was really trying to keep this relationship working, but she really didn't want to give anything away of what was going on. And then where things go from there for him. And it's just, yeah. I mean, it's, isn't that funny that we would try to hide our expertise in something because Yeah. She obviously knows what she's doing, but she has to pretend that she really doesn't, that she just lucked into it. Right. Um, <laughs> you can't jump up on the plane. I watched that show Hijack a couple of weeks ago. And this one guy is a mediator. That's what he does. And it's so funny because when he's in that position, he sees the plane completely differently from everybody else. And it's like these people walking in the room. They they have to foresee a room and still wonder where the exit is. I don't care how old they are. I think they've got to figure out, I've got to figure out a way out. Yeah. Because you just don't know what's going to happen. And it's got to, I mean, if you have this many experiences of trauma, I mean, let's face it, what they go through is a lot of trauma. You've got to be not scarred in some way, but sort of um, in, in like, just have some kind of a skin on you of, I could get myself out if I have to, what am I going to do? Like, I know the door's there. I know. Yeah. Always, there. always looking for an exit. And that, that is so stressful. Can you imagine that? I mean, when you and I go into a restaurant, we just look for a nice table, maybe by the window, right. but we're not looking at it like, oh, I can get shot through that window. Let me get in the back instead. Right. Um, a terrible, terrible stress. There were a couple of restaurants like that in the 80s where the mob guys ate and you would worry about it. But yes. usually the guys with the guns had really good shots. I mean, they were not, I've never heard of somebody else being taken out in a mob, in a mob incident. There were always... But there were a couple of restaurants you could really worry yourself about. You can worry, you know, yeah. walking on the street behind them, you know. <laughs> so, so the ending t- comes to you, and you're sitting there writing. And then do you go back and start the rewriting process? Like you do, yes. you do one really rough draft, and then go from there. The first draft is really rough. I mean, it's a piece of what I'm doing. You know, it's yeah. terrible. It's awful. And that's when I'm usually the most depressed. Is when I finish the first draft and I look at it and think. I'll never fix this. I don't know what to do with this. Um, it's all over the place. Um, by the third draft, it's starting to look like a book. Um, so I probably go through six, seven, eight drafts sometimes. Um, and that is probably where my I, my strength is, is I'm a great rewriter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, can take, I can take a terrible first draft and, and usually fix things. And, you know, it, it, I think that people don't think about how many drafts you go through before the reader actually sees it and where some of the plot points were and it wasn't really working for your editor or somebody from the outside sat and saw something. Who sees your work first when you finish it? Who's the first read? My husband. Okay. Um, no, but and he, and he doesn't see it until I feel it's ready to go to my agent. So he's the first read. He's very good at, at picking up, you know, like typos and, and misspellings and... Um, I really want somebody to read it for logic. Does this make sense? You know, um, or and, and and are you moved by it? That's the real other thing is I really need people to feel some emotional attachment to these characters. Then after he reads it, then it goes to my agent and um, and then she 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 passes it on to editors. Got it. So okay, so he's reading the book. Are you like circling the room, watching his face, trying to figure out what's going on? Or do you send him away for a weekend and go, here, come back with your comments? Because it would be like shattering to me if you've run all this work and they sit there and goes, mm, 
like this, you know, like this. And well, you know what? I I have to admit, I kind of I kind of see how many pages in he's gone. Like, how fast is he reading? Is he's really reading slowly? Does that mean it's boring? Um, and uh, I haven't yet had him say this is a piece of you know right. crap. Okay. He, he's just said, you know, at at the worst, it'll go pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And then you don't make dinner for three days. <laughs> now, what's your work schedule like? Do you get up in the morning and start writing? Like, do you have a definitive time you write every day? Oh, it's coffee and breakfast and a walk. And then I sit down and write. That's that's it. I mean, it's I'm very, I'm pretty much a, a creature of habit. And um, I don't, I love being by myself in my room. It doesn't bother me to be solitary. Right. Uh, and uh, I'll try and write. I mean, my goal is four pages a day. Don't always reach it. But that will get you a first draft within about six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay, you're okay. You're making dinner or you're out on a walk and you come up with an idea. Do you write it down someplace? Do you make if it it's a good time? idea? I will remember it. I don't need to write it down. Yeah, no. Okay. I mean, sometimes if, if it's late at night and you wake up and you have an idea, then you have to because you'll forget it by the morning. But I almost never get good ideas. Then it's always if I'm stuck, that's the issue. If I'm stuck. And I need an idea. I have a couple of things I do. You know, take a walk. I think walks are good. Um, hot water. You know, take a take a bath. But travel driving is probably the number one place where I've solved my most difficult mm -hmm. plot problems. Mm -hmm. Driving a, a really boring stretch of road with me at the wheel, nobody else in the car, just. Doing something else with your brain, because when your brain is engaged in a in a mundane task, it feels like the creative side is busy playing and figuring out what the mm -hmm. answer is. That's exactly. I used to love flights to California. Flights to California when there was no Wi-Fi. And you could just sit there and think for the yes. five hours you were flying out there. And there was one time I went out three times in one month. And it was one of my most productive months because I was thinking outside of what's due tomorrow. I was thinking big idea. And it, it's funny because it is when you're, it's also when you, when you have kids, they always say, just put them in the car next to you and they'll talk and tell you everything. And it's really <laughs> true. I mean, if you just say, let's go for a drive, you hear things that you wouldn't hear across the dinner table. And I think it's just that moment of you're going to someplace, you're, you're on a drive and your brain is kind of free to say, okay, wh what am I going to do? What am I going to say? And I think it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me how people can get, get themselves into a corner with or, or authors have told me this so many times and then get themselves out and just say, wait, I think I've got it. I think I've got what I can do. Yeah. 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 And it's almost like sometimes I'd like to take a book apart with somebody and say, okay, where did you get stuck here? Where was this? Where was that? And I think it'd be, if you're teaching a course in writing somewhere along the way, that would be the fun one to do is here's where I got stuck. And here's where I got to from there. Because people well, I think what's interesting is to go through somebody's multiple drafts and see mm -hmm. this is where you started, and and then the next draft something changed, and how did you get from this point to that point? Um, it almost requires you to really be able to have access to all the multiple versions of this book that somebody has written. Yeah, I just find that fascinating because it's not just I love to read a book; I love to think about how they got to the story. You know. So how did you get to the title of the Spy Coast? Because I love the title. I was like, well, well I, <laughs> I give all credit to Gracie Doyle, my editor, because mm -hmm. I think she was the one who came up with it. I uh, My original title was Spyville. Okay. And they said, this is too small. It's It feels like a, you know, a small book. Um, and we went through a couple Spy Town. Um, and then finally, it was the team at Amazon that just said Spy Coast was what they felt, felt like a, a big book. It feels like a big book. It feels like you could go a lot of places with it as well. And everybody yeah, it also gives it a coast. sense of place too. Yeah. yeah. It's what a coast looks like. Everybody knows. And then those footprints there, those little sinister footprints in the snow, like where are they going towards those trees? Mm, very scary. <laughs> very scary. The audio also has two narrators. Did you select the performers for your book or were they? I heard, I think I selected the, uh, the primary female narrator narrator. I don't think I've heard the, the other one. Is yeah. it? I think there, there are two. Um, let me just see. Hold on a second. I've got it written down. It is, uh, hold on a second. Um, Hillary Huber and Brittany Presley. I, I believe I heard Hillary Huber's voice. Yes. Okay. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun just to see her, how they, they portray the characters. Um, as I was reading, I think this book would make a great show. And I was so glad that I was so clever. And I see that Amazon has already optioned it. Like I did that by telepathy for series development. Are you going to be involved? Are you involved in that at all? 
No, I'm not. Uh, and, you know, it's um, this was actually part of the original offer from Amazon is that publish, publication plus Amazon Studios development. Wow. Yeah, which was one of the, another, you know, carrot that drew me over there. I thought, wow, you know, getting all this plus plus the uh, the support of this fantastic editorial team. Um, so we'll see. Uh, options are always iffy. Uh, we just never know when it will go into actual development. But yeah. We have to wait also for the Screen Actors Guild strike yeah. to end. <laughs> yes, we're close because deals are happening these days because we can at least do writers and producers. Like we're, we're like making that. progress. But boy, the strike is going on forever. They said we'll be solved on Halloween. Is it like trick or treat? You know, who knows? <laughs> you know? Who knows what's going on? But no, as you're reading it, and I'm, I'm going to be anxious to see what re readers feel the same way. You see it. You see you've written so vividly. And you can tell you've been to the places because there are little nuances in there. But it makes it so much fun. And then they can build like, you know, Istanbul in uh, L.A. They can figure it out. Right, right, right. Or why not go to Istanbul? <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why, why, why not do that? You know, Rizzolian Isles was a very successful series that ran for seven seasons. I looked up this morning. I was like, whoa, seven. Were you involved in that production at all? Or was that, um, were you like on set at all or anything? Uh, well, I visited the set twice and then I was on the show once. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I, it was all up to the showrunners. And, um, but they were, you know, they were, they welcomed me into the writer's room. I just told them that I had, I had book deadlines to make. So I really couldn't help them break story. Um, and they, um, the only things that they used really directly from me was the, the pilot episode, which was based on The Apprentice. And then there was one episode that was based on my short story. Um, but everything else they came up with. And it came up from there. Well, here, I think they've got a great like a roadmap. I mean, there's a great roadmap right here in this book about what to do. So what's next for the Martini Club? When's the next book? I know you're writing now. Is this next year? Um, it has a pub date uh, projected of April 2025. Okay, great. Yes. So I, ha I have I have a lot of time to, you know, to polish because I'm only on the second draft. <laughs> Well, you know what else too, though? You can hear the feedback on this one and you hear what people are excited about. And of course, that's going to be something that you're going to want to drive into the other book of what, like, you know, what are people really t tuned into like, the characters, on um, the settings? Like what is, what was making this book so much fun? And it's definitely the play between Maggie and Joe, because I could just yes. picture this, these two characters, like, really, you don't know what we're doing here? Like, you really <laughs> can't get this. And that, that is that is the basis of a great series because it's all about character, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I know, I know a lot of people, some people love the international settings and some people don't like the international settings. So I can't rely on readers to give me a roadmap as to where, mm -hmm. where it goes. Um, but I think everybody is pretty much uh, identifying with either Joe or Maggie. Right. Well, just the conflict between the two, the way the two are such different people and the way, you know, Joe, you feel like never left town, like she's been here her whole life. And this other woman traveled the world and has so much to offer her and has seen negotiating, has seen all these kinds of things that are going to happen. And I think it, it's a good, it's, it was a fun power play to watch the two of them going back yeah. up against each other right till the end. Like she shows up at the house and like, oh, no, again with these people, what are they doing? You know? But they're both so capable. They just have different spheres of capability. And that's what I love about that. <laughs> like, okay, you can probably, but the guys are not getting everything away really early. There's that body at the end of the driveway. Like, seriously, folks? Like, do you know this person? You know, and all of a sudden, alarm bells go off. And usually you see maybe a dead person right in your driveway, but you don't realize it's got something international implications. You're I just know. not thinking that. You're thinking somebody was walking in the wrong place at the wrong time. Not this, you know? And what do they say? It's like the two shots in the head is called what? A, a double tap. A double tap. But yeah, there's a double yeah. tap. Double tap is a giveaway that something really bad happened. And there's there's torture involved. And you just sit there and say, that doesn't happen in anybody's driveway, just anybody's driveway. You know, and she's sitting there like, whoa, here we're going to Maine. Are you kidding me? You know? Well, I think what really draw what really throws um Joe is Maggie's calmness about the whole thing. She doesn't act like a she doesn't act like a hysterical old lady, right? She's just asking questions and she's very calm about it. And Joe's going, what is it with this woman? <laughs> oh, well, let's look at the And then, of course, her security system with the 16 cameras. <laughs> it's so great because the, the dichotomy between the two, but it's, um, and also the way they have these fabulous meals that are based on where they've been. They're a crowd and all this poor woman, Joe, is on the outside and they just walks in the room and they look like, yes, <laughs> like, <laughs> Do you need our help? Do you need our help on what's going on right now? Because we can be there for you, you know? 
but we won't tell you much. We'll just solve it for you. Nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tess, this was just a great book. Once again, I'm telling you folks, this is her best. And I really give this super high praise. I sat down and started reading this and just could not stop. And I folded down some pages that we're back to because the settings, everything else is just so well done. So congratulations. I can't wait to see what you do next. Well, thank you. And it's so good to know I'm not over the hill yet. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Look at this. She's even got her hair touched to like match the cover of the book, folks. This woman is not over the hill at all, you know? <laughs> Such a pleasure seeing you again. And I'm looking forward to doing this again. And what is it? April, 2025, we'll be doing this yes. again? Yes. Okay. I'll be checking hey. again then. So thanks for joining us. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Remember, you can find us on the Book Report Network on YouTube, and you can find us on podcasts as Book Reporter Talks To as well. Thank you so much, everyone.